it looks kind of like the Brady Bunch if you've never used it before. Uh, but I highly recommend it because it gives you the opportunity to see everybody's reactions. And, you know, if we're all waiting on somebody to, to unmute, things like that, you can actually visually see that. Something else I want to remind you of is that. How, how, how do you do that? How do you do that? All right. So kind of towards the top of the video itself, you'll see a couple of little white icons. So one of them has four boxes on it. If you click that, it will turn it to the grid view. If you have individual tech help questions, uh, things that you need support on, audio issues, things of that nature, I'm afraid there's not a lot that I can personally do for you during the meeting. However, Heather has put her cell phone number into the chat. Please text or call her if you're having issues and she'll help walk you through uh, any possible solutions that may work out for you. I just won't be able to to work with you individually one on one, but she will. Uh, something else that we did last night, uh, we realized that in the Q and A, some of the questions that we got in advance would be great if we could put them on screen. So we're going to do that tonight, so that you'll be able to see those. We'll run through those questions and answers first and answer them to as best as we're able to. And then afterwards, we'll open up the floor and anybody else who has questions, we'll go into that. Before I ask Heather to pull up those questions and we go into the ones that were already sent in. Man, you ever start a sentence and you know that you had the rest of it and then lose it? <laughs> um, before we get going, I just want to remind everybody what this presentation was about. And this is mostly the startup phase of SWPF, Salt Waste Facili Processing Facility. They're coming out of a lot, long history of testing, and they're going into starting hot operations. And so that's going to be the focus of what we're talking about tonight. You may have some other questions. We'll try to get them answered if we can. But I just want to remind everyone that that's where we're, our attention is really going to be at tonight. Heather, as we get started, can you go ahead and pull up those questions that were sent in to us and share that screen? And then from there, uh, once they're up, Pat, if you can run down, you know, those first couple that you know that we have answers to. All right. Can, can you hear me all right? We can, yes, thank you. Okay, let's see. I think question five is a new one to me, so. It is, it is. We got it a little bit late this afternoon. I'm sorry, we didn't have a chance to get it over to you. Okay. So, um, the first question is, um, in your testing, what simulations do you run for off normal conditions, e.g., accidents and abnormal events for equipment, staff, and procedure testing? So, the off standard test performed in 2019 during coal commissioning included loss of plant air, loss of, loss of heating, ventilation, AC, so ventilation, um, loss of basic process control system, that's the computer that um, facilitates control of the, the process, and then lastly, loss of power. Uh, they cover the major systems that have the greatest impact on operations and safety, and uh, any not performed successfully the first time were repeated until they could ensure the facility could demonstrate demonstrate the ability to respond satisfactorily. Um, additionally, in addition to the, the off-standard off test, um, I, I don't know if y'all have it, but I'm hearing some feedback somehow. <laughs> um, additionally, SWPF has a simulator where procedures can be run for verification and validation. 
the uh, if you watch the presentation, um, the inner area transfers have been practiced multiple times per shift with operators from each facility participating in their respective simulators. Um, so um, related to the training question on abnormal response scenarios, um, the uh, emergency preparedness program developed scenarios that in involved injured persons, radiological releases, operational emergencies, and uh, safety basis um, scenarios. Each shift has performed multiple walkthroughs and tabletop drills, um, coach drills, and evaluated exercises. Going forward, uh, operations, participate, operations participation in the drills is mandatory to maintain their qualifications. So um, question two. If, if, if I could get question one, follow up if I could. Okay. But perhaps question two should have been first over question one. For any of the, the accidents or the uh, abnormal conditions that you discussed, are those your max credible by accident? Or is, are those... Uh, because I assume that they were in some fashion, but it didn't sound like a max credible accident. Well, they're, they're the major six that has the greatest impact of operations. Okay. Okay. And what accident would that be? What is your max credible accident? This so um, I've got this. That is the next question. So, uh, question two, is that, you ready to move on to question two? Yeah, go for it. Okay. So, question two is the max credi credible accident you consider for this facility and walk us through your response. So, I'm going to start with uh, a few points that um, it's better to explain before I get to a, a scenario. Um, first of all, the facility um, based on inventory is subcritical. Okay, so criticality is not a, um, a concern. Um, there is access control uh, for personnel entries into the process vessel cells and the east solvent extraction tank cell and um, the waste transfer enclosure. That's that access is prohibited following initial commencement of radioactive operations. Um, the no chemical or radionuclide exposures exceed the evaluation guidelines to the maximally exposed off-site individual. Uh, the equipment in the process cells are designed to performance category three and they are contained within the process cells during and after a seismic event. Uh, the waste piping in the process vessel cell areas is designed to PC3 also, which extends the primary confinement boundary of the seism seismically qualified vessels. Ventilation, that's an important system if the plant air compressors are lost. There are four days of compressed air backup available for ventilating selected tanks. This gives time to replenish the backup compressed air or restore the normal air supply or to provide portable air, compressed air, or to restore process vessel vent, vent ventilation. So the um, backup air dilution system um, it's monitored, it has low pressure alarm, and uh, it uh, is monitored to ensure four days of our air supply by monitoring the header pressure to ensure adequate flow. And it also has um, the, the primary air dilution system and the backup air receiver have connection points for a portable air supply. 
And then uh, the last point I'd like to make is there's a salt removal program that limits the solvent in each process vessel and therefore the fuel in case of a seismic event. So um, generally when there's uh, accident scenarios or ev evaluated, um, some of the worst ones assume that there's a seismic event, um, pipes break, uh, it releases some solvent into a diked area, and a fire occurs in, in the diked area from the spill of the solvent and the waste from piping or vessel failures. So um, that's that's a, one of the that's combining you know two two difficult situations. So uh, I discussed the primary ventilation and the backup ventilation and the um, and, and so the workers, just to follow the scenario, the workers are trained to exit the facility in the event of failure of the air dilution system, that's the backup. Also, personnel entry following a seismic event is restricted until it's determined that the entry is safe. And then lastly, the solvent removal program limits the volume of salt solvent that can be present in the process vessels and the piping at the time the seismic event occurs. Um, the reduction in the volume of solvent available acts as a fuel for a dike fire directly reduces the consequences resulting from a post-seismic dike fire. So, and that's outside the process cells. So after application of all those controls, the mitigated consequences are judged to be low to the facility worker in the on-site receptor and negligible for off-site receptors. Does that answer your question? It, it does in a way, but it doesn't kick the question one. If that's your maximum credible, credible action in a seismic event that has a follow on fire associated with it, do you test or do you run simulations for your staff with regard to the maximum credible accident, either via the actual equipment or on your simulator. And I didn't understand from question one that any of that was factored into your to your your hot functional or your cold, your cold operational, as you called it, testing. Uh, you know, like in a nuclear power plant, the loss of coolant accident, max credible, that's tested. And people run through that simulation to make sure that they understand it. So do you all do that? Hey, Pat, this is, you hear me, Pat? Pat, this is Jim Folk. Yeah. You hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Let, let, let me field that question or at least take a shot at it. So the question is, do we simulate that, that scenario? The answer is yes. So from an emergency uh, response perspective, what we've done, we, we held drills, we and, and I was emergency manager in the in the EOC for one of these drills. So you simulate that that issue, and you know as as you do that, you go into the control room and you say this is the drill, and off you go with that prescribed scenario or that issue. So the uh, the issue we had, and each drill can be tweaked a little bit differently. We run through each of the five um, um, shifts for those kind of drills, uh, specific to my example. As I was in the uh, emergency operations center, they they went through that whole exercise. So, you know, scenarios presented to them that there's been a seismic event, there's been a failure of a component, there may be a release, and then you see how your operators, and it's really more than operators, it's your whole emergency response program responds to that, that incident. So for instance, you would expect operators to take action to isolate uh, different components, maybe isolate tanks to pre prevent any spread of that that contamination, or or to prevent uh, you know fire, whatever it may be. If you have your fire uh, department will come in, and they will respond to the situation. They will obviously address any kind of fire, but they're also all of our hazmat have all of our hazmat functions. So they'll come in, secure the area, uh, start looking for any any potential victims that have occurred. And so 
you know, all of that is done in a simulated fashion, all the way down to the point where you may have somebody actually simulating uh, an injury. So how do they respond? How do they get them out of a, a simulated contaminated area and get them to a clean area, take them all the way to the hospital? So yeah, we go through those. Um, and that drill that, that I sat in on was probably three to four hours in length. So it's very detailed. It's not all just uh, make believe something happened. It's actually moving people around and doing your best to make it as realistic as possible. So yes, those those scenarios are identified, practiced, and tested. Quite frankly, through the um, through the operational readiness review, we'll go through and DOE will will um, you know prescribe a, a test like that. We'll we'll dem have the contractors demonstrate each of those functions. So you're looking at operations you're looking at rad control uh really the whole whole nine yards how does the more than just the facility the how does the site respond this is malcolm again i appreciate that 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 um uh that discussion yeah that's that's kind of a good standard practice i would have expected something in the discussion dealing with your testing to go to operations the hot functional and the the predecessor to that and the the stuff around that I assume that there would have been some discussion of that issue which is the reason i asked the question and i assume because this is not only testing on obviously your staff but you're testing your equipment you're testing as important as anything your procedures to make sure they all meld together in in, in abnormal events um, that 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 really could could create difficulties for the staff but i appreciate your response thanks and, and let me add you know that I, I thought you were focused more on the emergency response side of the house when you also consider all of the testing that has been done i think you know uh, pat described a lot of the specific tests that were occurring but then there's also a series of integrated tests that have been performed all before we add any waste to the facility so that uh, I believe uh, the kind of the wrap up test was called the design capacity production test or performance test, DCPT, where they went through and, and ran a complete simulation of the process from start to finish. Uh, and then there were certain requirements that they had to run, for instance, I believe it was uh, seven or 10 days consecutively, you know, consistent performance, verifying that the facility would respond all the things you talk about of the different procedures being tested, the, the um, operators responding, how they, they handle those situations. And so, you know, to make it as normal of a, or as an expected production run as you could. So yeah, we, we've tested those components up and down. We've tested procedures up and down. We've tested operators up and down. So uh, there's really been a significant amount of testing and proof of performance that's gone on throughout throughout the facility and the process and that's really you know been over the last year or two again summarized uh, a lot in the preparations for the readiness reviews that have been performed in those in those testing that occurred what what were your major sources of difficulty i.e in your corrective action program when you hit a problem what was typically the problem that you hit, or did everything fly by perfectly? I doubt. Uh, rarely would things fly by perfectly in any sense when you're starting up a facility this this big and this complex. But you know, you, you just have to deal with them as they come up. It could be as simple as uh, a procedure. You know, steps were were out of order in a procedure, and you stop and you take the time out. And you go fix that procedure. Uh, you know, I, I sat in on several. Pat, Pat mentioned the simulator. I sat in on several simulations that were done. And as they go through there, you know, you have different degrees of those um, those simulations. So one might be a what they call a coach drill. So the operator will be sitting there. He'll get to a step and say, "Man, I'm not sure how to do this one." And a coach will be there and say, "Okay, here's what you do," and he'll walk them through it. That's one level. Another level is, you know, you sit back and you say, okay, guys, this is yours. Go make it work. Um, you know, they follow those procedures. If they find an issue, they'll call a timeout, stop, we'll regroup. The equipment goes the same way. You know, there's, when you get down to it, there's uh, 
a lot of pumps, a lot of spinning equipment like contactors. And sometimes if they sit too long, they, they'll lock up or whatever. And if you run into one of those, you just go and, and have to fix it. So there's a variety of issues that have arised. But again, it's, um, you know, it's a stepwise process that you go through from start to finish to verify that each component, each operator, each uh, system will respond the way you expect it. And if it doesn't, you stop, you fix it before you move on. Uh, again, Malcolm, I don't want to beat this horse. I mean, I would love to continue this discussion, but this likely is not not, not productive for any. But uh, an aspect of that is obviously you hit a, a difficulty and you fix it. But what you do also, if you kick it into your corrective action program, and you say, why did that difficulty occur? Why was the procedure flawed to start with? And then you run down that that rabbit trail to try to understand to make sure that that's the only procedure that was flawed. It's a programmatic failure all over the place. Do you all go through that with your corrective action program, which I think is maybe not as strong as as typical contractors, or what? Actually, yes, we do. But find that, and a lot of times the term we use is extended condition. So, what you'll go through, and and if you identify, you know. It could be as simple as a typo. Okay, fine, we got it. We had a, a number inverted. We got it replaced. Fine. It was a, a singular mistake. Now, if you go through and you find that same mistake three or four times, then what you want to do is you regroup. You may do a causal analysis. You, you do some, some type of assessment. And again, extended condition may be one where you go through that series, and let's just say it was transfer procedures. You, so you if you found an error in two or three in a row, you might go back and say, okay, Let's, let's take a, a break here. We're going to go back and we're going to review all of our transfer procedures to ensure that this mistake, whatever it was, did not manifest itself in several places. And uh, sometimes you'll find it was a one-time mistake. Sometimes you'll find it was more significant. And, you know, that you can pull the string on that all the way back and find that, oh, Jim Folk was the guy that wrote all of these procedures. And Jim Folk had a bad day <laughs> or he didn't know any better. And, uh, and so, you know, we'll fix Jim Pope, and then we can go on and uh, fix the procedures. So, again, it, it could be the source of those issues could be singular, could be multiple, uh, could be whatever, but we have a program to go back and find out uh, whether there is a common cause to those issues. Of course, if we were really going through this and, and running the, 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 the trot line on this, what we would say, okay, that's good, a generic description about what specific programmatic issues you found with regard to the to the testing that you did. But let's stop here and go to question three. I appreciate your responses. I love them. These are good, solid responses. Thanks. Question three. All right. So uh, question three is, what is the status of operational staffing and training for the staff? Is it completed? What's an overview of the training with a focus on accident and abnormal events? So uh, operations personnel were initially qualified on systems and conduct of operations um, before coal commissioning over two years ago. The training involved system training in the classroom, field walk downs, and uh, under instruction watch standing, and simulator exercises for control and personnel. Um, qualification was dependent on written exam on performance demonstrations and oral boards for shift managers, for control room managers, and shift technical engineers. The requalification period is every two years, and the continuing training program ensures operators do not lapse. Um, in recognition that uh, testing and hot operations is not the same, the time between the two training periods, the operations personnel completed the proficiency program in August prior to the final uh, August 2019, prior to the fi uh, final operational readiness review. And that program included performance of the operating procedures and responding to abnormal conditions. Uh, for shift managers, for the control room managers and the shift technical engineers, it also involves an oral board. So, um, any any other questions on that? 
I'll do a quick follow-up with regard to the status of the operational staffing. I guess what you're saying is the staffing is in place. You've got full complement of staffing today. There's there's not um, uh, there, there, there are not gaps in your staffing to date. I .e. you're not continuing to hire. What's your but a follow-up question on that score? What's your overtime turnover? I mean, do you have um, um, turnover problems? Do you have an extra shift? That's that's present in, in the event of turnover issues or uh, well, issues that issues that's, about. So so that's a, an excellent lead in to the, the question four. <laughs> what is the typical shift staffing for the facility operations? And um, so typically um, there are four fourteen people. Uh, per shift, and we have um, five shifts. Uh, they're all fully staffed, and what the fifth shift allows us to do is to ensure that one of those five shifts is on training all the time. So we're able to both operate and train in parallel. Um, the uh, in the operation staffing, uh, there is a shift operator, there's 14 that I'm going to list here, shift operations manager, a shift technical engineer, a control room manager, the operations field supervisor, four control room operators, five field operators, and one shift clerk. And um, that doesn't actually include some of the supplementary staffing for um, just for night shifts. There are four maintenance personnel, five radiological controls, and four in the laboratory, one chemist and three technicians. And the day shift is much larger. Um, the, day, the larger day staff can augment the shift assignments as necessary or if there's a special um, Procedure, so, um, but that's that's the shift complement there. On that score, do you have do you have full support maintenance support during day shift and night shift, or just do it during day shift? But but all and that's maintenance support. Yeah. So so yeah, that maintenance support that I gave of for maintenance. That's a minimum. That's for the night shift. So there are larger numbers of maintenance, radiological controls, and laboratory during the day shift, but but those are minimum supplements for the night shift. Okay. Thank you. So the last question. Um, I'm sorry, um, James. I'll have to. We'll have. We'll probably get another opportunity to talk about SWPF. <laughs> That's okay. If this is one that we need to come back to at a later date, or maybe if you can send me the a response to it tomorrow, we can send it out to the whole board. Okay, great. Be happy to do that. Heather, will you stop the screen share for me? Thank you. Okay. So, are there any other questions from any other board members? Narendra, let's start with you today. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to congratulate DOE for getting the project done ahead of time. And I know it's been in, a, uh, in, in, in making for a long time, and it's good. One place uh, I noticed that, that She's been talking about two radioactive streams going back to BWPF. One is solid, another liquid. What is the reason for two separate streams going to DWPF? So, Did you get it? Um, yeah, uh, you want me to take that, James? Um, so yes, please. The, sol the solvent extraction process um, transfers cesium from the waste over onto the solvent. 
and then the cesium is stripped from the solvent into a, uh, a much smaller volume stream that we call strip effluent. So that is the liquid stream that goes to CWTF, and it's, it's high in cesium-137 because it's been concentrated uh, into a smaller volume. The solid stream is actually the front end process that occurs in salt waste processing facilities. And the first step that happens to the waste when it comes into the process is uh, monosodium titanate is added to absorb strontium and actinide. Um, it is agitated for a certain period of time to make that absorption um, complete. And then it is filtered through a cross flow filter. Um, that filtrate, that clarified salt solution, goes on to the solvent extraction process, but the concentrated MSC and any entrained blood solid is collected in a tank. It is washed to reduce the with water to reduce the sodium content a little bit from waste residuals, and then periodically it is transferred over to DWPF. Um, to take the strontium nexonide DWPF so it can be incorporated into the borosilicate glass. So those are the two strands, and that's how they get created. Does that answer your question, or do you have another question? I, I think you have answered very nicely, but I have two more questions, if you will allow me to do that. One is, uh, do you wash the sludge before it goes to DWPF? Yes. Um, that, so that was the, uh, the last step. The, the sludge is collected, and then before the transfer is made to DWPF, it is washed from the nominal waste um, concentration of about 6.4 molar sodium down to 0.5 molar sodium. So, yes, it is washed. And that's part of ensuring glass another, quality. Another, another follow-up question is, uh, the liquid you send it to salt stone, what is the curry content on that? What is the what? Curie contents. Oh, okay. Um, so, hmm, I'm trying to think if I have that. Um, so, the decontaminated salt solution that goes to salt stone has at least a decontamination factor of 40,000 from the incoming stream. Um, and we anticipate the normal or typical incoming stream will be two carries per gallon. So if I can find my calculator. <laughs> That's why, you know, when I understand it. I know the system. Uh, I'd like to thank you for the wonderful presentation and uh, educating us. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Serena, before we move on to the next person, Pat, I'm wondering if you can help people like me who don't necessarily know what all this means. I mean to wash sludge. So it, it's really very simple. Um, if you have a, a lot of salt, dissolved salt in, in with the sludge, and it resembles the, the waste that it came in with, but of course it's been concentrated through the filtration process. The washing is you add water, so, for example, you double you 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 filter some of the uh, original salty liquid out. You add water and stir and filter out that. Add more water and stir and filter out that. So that's the process. And what that you know your filtration keeps the solids in the same place, but you're gradually reducing that sodium that's in the liquid. And you know. Okay. Does that help? The, so the glass can take some sodium, but it can't take a lot of sodium. So th there are um, constraints on the on the levels that there can be in that liquid that goes with the MSD and any entrained sludge. Okay, I think I understand it now. Uh, does anybody else have any questions, Jim? I think I saw your hand up earlier. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, my. I'm back to the uh, staffing issues. Um, the facility is, I assume, running 24-7, is that correct? Correct. And therefore, you and your staff is working basically a 40-hour week? 
So the shifts were 12 and a half hour shifts. Um, the, the operating operating shifts are, are 12 and a half hours long. Now, you know, I'd like to differentiate between that and some of the, what I call normal day staff. You know, that you have other day staff that don't, that are not part of the control room operation, for example. So, so um, how many positions need to be manned to support that 24-7 operation? For the, okay, you've got your five shifts that have 14 control room um, and plant operators. And then you have the support personnel for maintenance and radiological controls and the laboratory. And then in the, the daytime, um, you have other support um, personnel that are not actually operating the process uh, in uh, procedures and training and, and various um, other skill sets. So uh, you're looking for a total head count? Is that what you're looking for? Actually, I'm looking for what would be the head count of this of the uh, chairs, the seats, the that you need to uh, have coverage in order to operate the facility. So, um, so you you've got your your 14 operation staff, and then you have. Um, 13 support staff that are in maintenance radiological controls in the lab laboratory. So, so roughly double your operation staff and you, you've got it for a night shift. Okay, so you're running basically 28, somewhere around there, of seats that need to be filled uh, in order to run the plant. Do I understand that correctly? Correct, but you would want those support staff that are there during the day. You know, they're writing procedures. They're, um, you, you know, so so yes, it's you know we just discussed kind of a minimum operating level for managing the process, but you're going to have plenty of other people that are needed to do various things. Yeah, I understand. There's going to be a lot of overhead operations and support activities that can take place, but they take place without, they're not required to be able to operate the facility, at least over some short period of time. Correct. Okay, thank you. If I could have a follow-up on that as well. Um, you talked about general staff. I think what the question may have been designed around was, I assume you have something called something like tech spec technical specifications. So your tech spec staff, what's required by your technical specifications for operation? And I assume that's obviously your ship supervisor, your control oper operators, and and some other folks in there. But it's I'm guessing not 28 people. Well, uh, I think. I think you're referring to maybe the um, other technical engineering staff that that are uh, specialists in, in certain systems, um, and, and that would that would typically be part of your day day staff. But tech specs don't don't say typically. Tech specs say this is your minimum staff complement that you have to have to operate the facility. Period. Jim, I, Jim Folk, I think I see your hand up. Do you want to chime in on this? You're muted. Yeah, I'm having trouble hearing you, Jim. So, so Malcolm, I. So what you're asking for is a minimum staffing? Well, that's what the question was. What's the minimum staffing that you need to have to operate the facility? And I guess that kicks in accordance with your technical specifications or whatever whatever your your legal document says, I need to have these to have the facility uh, in operation, period, bottom line. 
So, so there, there is a um, normal staffing, which is the 14 people that I went through in terms of the shift operations manager, a shift technical engineer, part of room manager, um, operations field supervisor, four control room operators, five field operators, and one shift clerk. Now, there is also a defined minimum staffing. Um, and so that would reduce the control room operators from four down to three at minimum staffing. And that would reduce field operators from five down to three. And it would delete a shift clerk. Right? And that would be without a shift clerk. So, yes, minimum staffing is defined. And that would be a total of 10 for the, the operation. Okay. All right, Pat, I want to go to a question that's in the chat. I think it goes back to when I was asking about washing sludge. Uh, Candace Cave has asked us what happens to the contaminated water. So interesting enough, it all goes up to the front end back into the first tank and gets treated with the waste. Very cool. All right, any other questions from the board? Hearing none, I'll go ahead and throw in the T norm since I'm now a T norm fan from last night. Is T norm an issue in any of this in the in this? Salt uh, waste processing facility of uh, T-norm being technically um, enhanced, uh, um, normally occurring radioactive material. That 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 issue that we discussed last night. I don't think so. We have um, we have criteria for what we allow to be put into salt batches and sent as feed, and I don't think we have any issues due to that. I'm not aware of any. Okay. Anything else, folks? Give you a second to unmute just in case. Going once, going twice. All right. Well, thank you everyone for tuning in tonight. I really appreciate it. We'll get this recording up on YouTube just so that everyone else who wasn't able to join us uh, can see the questions and answers and we'll have those available for everybody. Uh, I will say that in just a moment, we'll stop recording and I'll hang on the line for a few minutes. If anybody else has any cap related questions about operations, anything that I can help answer, I don't mind sticking around for a little while to help out with that. But thank you very much, everybody, and I appreciate your attending. Thank you. Thank you, James.